Um, this is brought to us um, by uh, Dr. Miriam and Sheldon G. Adelson um, Policy Seminar Series on Capitol Hill. What we're going to discuss today is an extraordinarily important topic. In 1939, when the Nazis marched into Poland, my namesake, Sarah Neuberger, was asked to strip down naked, dig a hole, and then she was mowed down together with every other member of her village. Why? Because she was a Jew. On February 1st, 2002, Islamic terrorists in Pakistan kidnapped the Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl, and before they severed off his head, he was forced to say on tape, I am a Jew. This summer, three Israeli teenagers, Naftali Franco, Iyam um, Yirak, and Gilad Sha'er, were kidnapped and murdered by Hamas terrorists while hitching home from school. Why? Because they were Jews. In France, this summer, in one week alone, eight synagogues were attacked. One was firebombed by a mob of 400 people. The windows of a kosher butcher store and a Jewish-owned pharmacy were smashed, and as the stores were being looted, the cries of death to the Jews and slit Jewish throats were heard. In Germany this summer, Molotov cocktails were robbed at the Bergische Synagogue, previously destroyed in Kristallnacht, and a Berlin Imam Abu Bilal Ismail called on Allah to, quote, destroy the Zionist Jews, hunt them and kill them to the very last one. Bottles were thrown um, through the window of an anti-Semitic uh, an, an anti um, campaigner in Frankfurt. Um, did this, an elderly Jewish man was beaten up at a pro Israel rally in Hamburg. An Orthodox Jewish teenager was punched in the face in Berlin. In several cities, chants and pro-Palestinian protests compared Israel's actions to the Holocaust. Other notable slogans included, Jew, coward, pig, come out and fight alone. And Hamas, Hamas, Jews to the gas. These are the worst times since the Nazi era, Dieter Grammen, president of Germany's Central Council of Jews, told the Guardian. On the streets, you hear things like, the Jews should be gassed, the Jews should be burned. We haven't had this in Germany for decades. Anyone saying these slogans isn't criticizing Israeli politics. It's just pure hatred of Jews, nothing else. And it's not a German phenomenon. It's an outbreak of hatred against Jews so intense that it's very clear indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't 1939 in Berlin. This is 2014. And this is not only happening in Europe. Just last week, on Thursday, two Jews were coming home from the synagogue in Baltimore, Maryland, very close to here, and they were sprayed with bullets. On college campuses from Harvard, Columbia, and NYU on the East Coast, to the University of Chicago, and University of Illinois in the Midwest, to UCLA and Berkeley and, and San Francisco State on the West, and hundreds and hundreds of points in between. There are anti-Israel rallies that quickly disintegrate excuse me, into hate fests against Israel and the Jewish people. And within the college classrooms, our taxpayer dollars are funding Middle Eastern studies programs that have such huge anti-Israeli biases the ancient old virus of anti-Semitism. The United Nations, an institution that was founded upon the loftiest of ideals, including the affirmation of faith and functional human rights, and the dignity and the worth of human persons, and in equal rights for men and women, and nations large and small, we see the United Nations has its share of institutional guilt when it comes to anti-Semitism. As Anne Bayevsky said in a conference at the UN on September 8th, the United Nations itself is a leading institutional purveyor of anti-Semitism. 
35% of all resolutions ever adopted by the UN Human Rights Council, the body that condemns human rights across the globe condemns just one state and one state alone, Israel. That's unprecedented. 50% of the emergency general sessions that were convened this past year condemn one state and one state alone, the state of Israel. That's anti-Semitism. When Israel was forced to respond to the over 2,000 missiles that were lobbed at her this summer from Gaza, along with the huge labyrinth of tunnels stemming from Gaza that, are ent that were entering into communities in uh, order to abduct Israeli citizens, a commission of inquiry was launched by the Human Rights Council um, this past July on alleged war crimes in Gaza. There are no such commissions as ever launched about the abuses of hiding markets among civilians in residential neighborhoods and schools and hospitals. That's anti Semitism. This is happening at the very same moment in history when about 200,000 Syrians have been slaughtered by their own regime and approximately 3 million are living as refugees. So North Korea, Korea is like one great big concentration camp. So the Islamic Republic of Iran hangs Christians and other religious minorities, homosexuals, and women and even children who have been raped. Saudi Arabia can tell you for practicing another religion or sorcery, and women are stoned to death if they are ever convicted of rape, and by the way, men are never convicted of rape. Yet one country and one country alone is disproportionately singled out for criticism. When citizens are attacked and are forced to respond, despite Article 51 of the United Nations Charter that says each member nation has an inherent right to self-defense. Why? Because it is the one and only Jewish state in the world. And that's anti-Semitism. Ten years ago, the famous Soviet dissident and current Jewish agency chair, Natan Sharansky, wrote about, quote, the new anti-Semitism, defining it as hatred against the Jewish state, as opposed to the old anti-Semitism, which he defined as simply hatred against the Jewish people or the Jewish religion. He then went on to articulate his 3D test to detect anti-Semitism. The first C stands for demonization. When Israel alone is being demonized, when its actions are blown out of proportion, when the students in universities throughout the West compare Israel to the Nazis and Palestinian refugee camps to Auschwitz, when academic departments throughout the West use this as a bias to boycott to death and sanction Israel universities and to stop scholarly research of Israeli academics. That is anti Semitism. The second D stands for double standards. When criticism of Israel is applied selectively, when Israel alone is being constantly singled out for human rights abuses in the United Nations. Um, and the third D stands for delegitimization. When Israel alone, among the nations of the world, is denied a fundamental right to exist or to defend the civilian population. I might add to that definition that when the community of nations imposes conditions upon Israel that it would find absolutely impossible to impose on itself a survival, that is anti-Semitism. We have her today, we're very, very lucky to have her today, two wonderful people to talk about this. I, would, I first want to introduce you to Michael Shapiro who is the uh, foreign policy legislative director for um, Chairman Pete Roskam, who introduced and passed a wonderful resolution in the House about uh, anti Semitism. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and uh, it's, it's obviously good to be with you guys. I've worked with Emmett on so many occasions now, and we've really had a great working relationship. They do phenomenal work, and uh, I don't really know what's left to be said after that. Uh, that introduction to this issue, I also want to uh, thank my friend Mark, who uh, we've also been able to work together on a few issues now, and uh, it's good to be here. So, 
Um, I think the one the one thing that, that stuck struck out uh, from Sarah's introduction. Well, first of all, I appreciate the shout out to my alma mater, which is Columbia, in New York. Um, a school where uh, I was not too long ago uh, when I was there. I mean, this is a, a, a phenomenal university, an academic uh, powerhouse, and a school that prides itself on academic freedom. It's also a school that, on the flip side, opens itself up to um, just a vast array of anti Israel sentiment uh, and even anti Semitism. I mean, this takes the form of uh, fake. Israeli tanks on campus. I can't tell you how many times I witnessed fake Israeli checkpoints on campus. Uh, what are called as uh, what are called dalliance, which is when students pretend to die in mass in the middle of campus to point out of what they claim the Israelis are doing to us. Um, it's a separate issue. I'm happy to get into it with any of you guys. Uh, the only thing that I think she touched on is this issue of this concept of new anti-Semitism. It's something that. She elaborated far, far more eloquently than I can, but um, I think what we're seeing now and what we saw just this summer is the, the tendency to take Israel and single Israel out. And there's a difference because what you see is you see anti-Israel activists say, I'm not anti-Semitic, right? That's not what we're doing. We're criticizing the policies of the Israeli government. And frankly, we're not we're not saying you can't criticize certain policies of the Israeli government as you can any government, the United States government. Uh, you know, I work here and I criticize it just as much or maybe even more than a lot of you. So, um, but there is a difference. And it's using this cover to anti, being anti-Israel uh, as a guide for being anti-Semitic. And there is a difference, and you can tell. You can tell when those same people use the word Zionists instead of Jews. I mean, it's not a word that to us, it is derogatory, but in use in certain contexts, it is. Um, and you can see it in, again, the same way now with boycotts, an issue that um, I've worked on with my boss and uh, I've tried to get more members of Congress uh, educated on it. It's definitely an issue where, again, it's one thing to boycott a country based on their policies. People will say, you know, trackers will say, we boycotted South Africa during the first time. Great. We, we all agree that, that that was warranted and justified and it accomplished the correct goal. Now what we're seeing is a singling out of Israel, purely not on the basis that people disagree with policies, the alleged occupation, and so forth. It's that Israel's a Jewish state. And that's purely what we're seeing here. And we can see in the academic work of Israel, what they say, we're not only going to boycott the Israeli academic institutions, we're going to boycott professors even if they're independent of those institutions. I mean, that is anti-Semitism. That is not that is not a boycott to try to change policies or um, So, um, you know, I've one experience. I, I've had the pleasure to go to Israel just a couple times in the last uh, couple months. Um, the last time I was there, which was the um, beginning of August, um, I had an experience I've never had in the many, many times I've been there, which is the opportunity to talk to a lot of recently Anyway, Jews from Europe, and in particular the French. And obviously, talking to an educated audience, you guys all know what's going on there. And I actually thought I did too, based on the news articles. What I didn't really realize was just how bad it was. And here we first went from literally a family of five, two young children, a husband and wife, who uh, just a week earlier had finally made out of Israel. Um, and the stories they told were horrific. I won't repeat them all, but we're talking their kids getting beat up. We're talking their kids not being able to go out in public. The, the husband not being able to wear a keeper in public. And on the positive side of all that is the fact that they were just the happiest people we ever met. I mean, they, they literally told a story about their son having to turn his ear ripped off for being Jewish. But they were the happiest family we ever met. Why? Because they were not Israel and they were actually free to to live Jewish lives. So uh, that was something that really stuck with me from that visit and something that I never really encountered on such such a scale in foreign Israel. So quickly because I, I, I do have to run and I apologize for that because Mark did a fantastic presentation and I'm fully updated. Uh, but I guess the good thing about leaving you with is thank you. The good thing I'll leave you with at least in terms of Congress and I think obviously you don't tend to get much done here in the case. But one issue where we've actually found support on both sides of the aisle is this issue of anti-Semitism. And honestly, on this other issue of issues on issues of Iran and ISIS nowadays and Syria, uh, 
there are still divides. There are inter-party divides. There are divides, obviously, across the aisle. There are divides with the administration. Um, but anti-Semitism is one issue that I think members of Congress, again, Democrats and Republicans have really come to understand. And I think they're more and more aware of this concept of new anti-Semitism and trying to distinguish between one is racism and one is racism and what things are going to do. So we were able to pass the resolution just a couple weeks ago when the last day was kind of for the um, recess to go get reelected. Um, and it was a bipartisan resolution again that we did with Congressman Jerry Nadler, who I want to give a lot of credit to, the Democrat from New York. We're talking a very liberal Democratic congressman, and my boss is a conservative uh, Republican from Chicago. Um, and a couple of the things that we pointed out in this resolution, among others, is a recent ADL study. And again, we all know the anti Semitism is a growing problem. It's not something that's in the past, it's, it's very much alive. But ADL did a recent study. Um, I also want to give them a lot of credit, and they, they surveyed 100 countries and the attitudes of people in those countries towards Jews, uh, not towards Israel, towards Jews. And, and what they found was rather shocking. 26% of a quarter of the people they surveyed in 100 countries, uh, they found that anti-Semitic views. When you switch to the Middle East, that goes up to 74%. So we're talking about the region where Israel is obviously surrounded by a lot of bad neighbors, um, and, and that's shocking. We point out the tools that the State Department has, the Secretary of Security has, the Administration General has to help combat this, because it's not just a, a, a vague concept that we talk about abstractly. This is a concept where we need to actively combat it just as much as those that are anti Semitic are, are uh, rallying against the Jewish state and Jews across the world. So, um, 176 co-sponsors on this piece of legislation were able to pass it by a voice vote unanimously in the House. I uh, hope this passed in the Senate with the help of groups like EMIC. Uh, we were able to do this. Again, not a lot get done here. And even on resolutions like this that you think would be non controversial, we really need all the support you can get. So my pitch to you guys is uh, it really does make a difference when you reach out to the legislators, uh, to the staff like myself. Um, that's how we hear about uh, other initiatives on the forefront, especially to your hometown representatives and senators. So our first is going to be now. We hope that uh, everyone here will, will, will take part in that. And, and please, you know, Sarah, we'll give you guys my contact information. But please contact me if you have questions, if, uh, if, you, if you have ideas for things that you think we should be doing. Uh, just thank you for coming out and supporting uh, a really fantastic organization. In that. So, I think I think there certainly is. Um, I don't want to give the impression that it's all it's all okay here. I think in the Congress, I think there is a good understanding that this is a problem. I think there could always be more of an emphasis, and we can never take that for granted, even when we're passing pretty simple bipartisan measures like this. Um, but I don't want to give the impression that it's all okay here, and we can be complicit and or not complicit, complacent. Uh, I mean, again, going back to my own model, what I saw firsthand, uh, it really is this concept of uh, Israel is the new target. And I think what we've seen on a larger scale, and we are seeing in the United States, is a shift in strategy by, by people that are either anti-Semitic or anti-Israel or both, which is they've stopped resorting as much to terrorism and more to diplomacy, and more through diplomatic channels and through more peaceful channels, but that can be just as destructive. I mean, this goes to the UN and all these issues that uh, Sarah mentioned in her introduction, but I mean, it's certainly a here, and it's taking the cover of being anti-Israel, and that's that's the problem. And again, we are all staunch defenders of Israel here, uh, but we have to also ourselves distinguish when someone's being anti-Semitic and when they're simply criticizing the policy of the Israeli government. We, if you read Haller, it's I mean, we see enough criticism of the Israeli government that's probably not anti-Semitic, it's just they don't like Bibi Netanyahu, they don't like the Bibi Lieberman, that's fine. But we also here need to make that distinction because it's important to understand the difference when we're, uh, I'm trying to end my time, but I think it's important to understand the difference here too. Right, I think that Michael makes an extraordinarily valuable point. Um, Many of us criticize all sorts of um, policies of various administrations here in America, but we never say, therefore, America should not exist, it should cease to exist. When you have a policy criticism, a legitimate policy criticism of a country, and then you leap 
to that conclusion. Therefore, Israel should be wiped off the map. That's anti-Semitism. Okay, now, um, I really want to thank Michael very much. Thank you, Michael. And um, Chairman Rostam for his wonderful resolution and for his vigilance and, you know, this wonderful, wonderful work on the committee as well. Fantastic work. Fantastic work. And um, um, I know we're going to be working and partnering very closely together with you for many years to come. Right. Now it is indeed a rare pleasure. Thank you.